Hi, everyone. Welcome to Reporters Roundtable. I am Rafe Needleman in San Francisco. And uh, today on the show, we are discussing one of my favorite topics, failure. Failure, as it turns out, is always an option. At least it appears that way for all the, uh, if you've been following technology. Apple has its failures, Google, Facebook. Most recently, Path had a big failure of communication where it turns out that they were uh, absorbing their iPhone users' address books into their servers in order to match Path users up with other Path users. Not necessarily such a bad thing, but Path didn't tell its users that they were doing it uh, and then followed a rather, as uh, one of my guests called it, a supine apology and uh, further accusations about what Path had been doing in the past. But this kind of thing happens all the time. Companies are always making flubs. They're all moving so fast. They're going to make mistakes. The question is, how do you prepare for these mistakes and how do you respond to them once they happen? And what, uh, what can we all learn from what Path, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Zynga, uh, Netflix have done in the past when they've fallen on their faces? Today, to discuss this really interesting topic, I've got two old friends with me. First, uh, both dialing in, first from San Francisco here, Owen Thomas, who is founding editor of The Daily Dot. You can follow his great work there. Owen, uh, it's great to have you here. Owen uh, gained some notoriety himself uh, after he worked for me at Red Herring uh, <laughs> by working at uh, Valleywag. He was the chief Valleywag blogger for a while. Um, very entertaining and insightful stuff over there, and quite controversial. Thank I learned you. it all from you, Ray. Aw, shucks. Anyway, thanks, Owen, for joining us. Also joining us uh, from New York, another old friend, Brooke Hammerling, who is a communications professional extraordinaire who has built her own business uh, doing exactly that. Brew is the founder of Brew PR, which counts as its clients, uh, big companies like NetSuite, NetSuite and One King's Lane, which is just exploding. Brooke, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, of course, your companies have never made any mistakes, have they? Well, you know, it is, I mean, we can talk about it. Sure, they've made lots of mistakes, <laughs> but uh, it's all how you handle it. So let's get, into, let's get into this today by talking about the one that's in the news right now, of course, which is PATH. Why, I just explained what PATH did. Uh, is this a tempest in a teapot, or is this really a big deal? Uh, Brooke, you first. What do you think about the PATH flap? Well, I think, you know, I think uh, uh, Owen's alma mater of Gawker uncovered something pretty uh, crucial here, which if it's true, then we have a problem because it seems that the founder hasn't told the truth. And that is, it looks like he had told Ballywag, Gawker, whatnot, that this had actually not, they did not keep the data and that they deleted it and nothing was kept on. On, on their servers, and that turned out to not be true. So that's the even bigger issue. If mm -hmm. they were asked this in the past, and then they've proven in writing, which they have an email, saying absolutely not, I hope you, that answered your question, we don't save it, and then boom, and a rogue engineer shows that that's not true. That's a real problem. So um, it, you lose trust in that. But ultimately, I think um, people have very short memories, and it moves on. I do think it's, it's a crack in the, uh, the, the shiny veneer of Path, though, for sure. Oh, and, and they've already weathered a storm, so in terms of just the design itself, the first round. So the version two is this sort of rebirth, and then this sort of you know, thing knocks that, that shine off of it. Owen, what do you think about uh, Path's fortunes, Path and what they're doing right now? Well, I think what's interesting is they, they did change. So when they launched, they weren't keeping this information on their servers. Then, very quietly, before they launched Path 2.0, before everyone loved them again, in March 2011, if I, if I understand it correctly, they started retaining this data on their servers to develop a new technology they're calling FriendRank, which helps you find your quote-unquote real friends, your close friends, the ones you actually want to share your, you know, your daily moments with. Uh, that's what Path lets you do. That's you know what's great about Path is it's this really small, tight community. Um, the the thing is though that they didn't tell anyone um, that that had changed. They didn't say, "Hey, I know we said in November 2010 that we're not keeping this on our servers. We decided, you know, it's now March 2011. We decided we're going to keep it on our servers now because it helps us do cool things for you." Mm -hmm. um, and you're going you're gonna to have to click a button when you upload the latest version or when you download the latest version and give us permission to do that. That's what they should have done in March 2011. 
they didn't and do what that. I don't understand, I don't understand is it's so easy, right? They make, and Dave made this big apology and then they've now made it opt in. But why, when they've seen the history of how these things work, when they know these things have the tendency to come out eventually, why they wouldn't have done that in the first place? So, Brooke, well, let me, let that's, me. That's the other thing is, is they didn't have to do this in, uh, they didn't have to do this in March. Sorry, that's Ramona. Your, your dog Ramona's, wants to say, comment on this as Ramona well. Ramona is very upset about this whole fracas. Um, <laughs> Considering Owen they, is the biggest path user, so they, I would say. They had yes. another chance. So they could have done this in March. They also could have, um, oh, uh, two weeks ago, they were preparing a new version. This is their story. They said, we have this new version with the opt-in. It was ready to go. It's already submitted to the App Store. And then this thing broke. So why, like, if they knew that they were going to do this, if they were going to create this new version, why didn't they announce, you know, before anyone caught them, hey, we made a mistake. That's what their blog post said. We're sorry. We made a mistake. But they knew they'd made a mistake already. So the moment at which they realized they made a mistake, the moment at which they realized they had to, they had to revise their software, to make it opt in. Mm. That's when they should have been. How do you possibly act fast enough to stay ahead of the vitriol that spread so quickly over the web though? I mean, I'm sure that when Path, when Dave Morin over at CEO of Path and his whole crew saw what was going on, they said, oh, you know, we've got to craft a response to this that is uh, appropriate and has this right emotional tone, et cetera. And yet while they're working on that, you've got commenters all over the blogosphere saying, I'll never trust these guys. They're a bunch of scum. They deserve to die. I mean, I saw posts like that pop up immediately after this thing happened and immediately after that Gawker story, which, by the way, was true, but at a different time. At I a mean, different time. So and that's, I, that's true. How do you, Brooke, how do you counsel uh, your companies to prepare for the incredibly fast and uninformed and emotionally violent stuff that comes out anytime right. anybody makes even the smallest of slip-ups. Right. Well, in that particular case, what I found surprising is that I started hearing about it that Tuesday late uh, afternoon, uh, early evening. And I don't think it came out. They didn't make any comment until the following day. I guess the news started to spread overnight. But I mean, that's something that they should have attacked. They should have been no sleep. They should have addressed it immediately. Um, I'm not sure when the timing of the apology went out, but you know, there's there's something to be said for the speed for which one accepts and acknowledges a mistake, and and then kind of goes and, and finesses it and goes after the different audiences and whatnot. Um, but I, I would have done it immediately. I would have done a mea culpa, and 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 you know, there's certain levels of crisis. This is a big one. I mean, there are certain ones that people are going to get all up in arms about, and we can talk about some of those mm -hmm. that. Um, that then the the customer the company has to eventually go and change. I think Netflix is a great example, and you know so they didn't move very fast. But then when they did, and when they did change it, and they did make a mea culpa, uh, it, it it turned people's impressions of them for sure. Yeah, I, but I, you, you I, have I, to I do move think, fast. I do oh. think Dave's apology was absolutely right. You know, I I. I Teased him a little. I called him a, a supine apology. But that's what you have to do. You have to roll on your back and just... 100%. Put, yeah, and just say, I, I, I surrender. I Total, total screw up. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be defensive. You can't be even the slightest bit defensive. If you're the slightest bit defensive, um, people will just tear you apart again. And I think that's what Airbnb saw, is like they were not, um, they were not fully apologetic enough they were a little bit defensive. They were, they were entirely defensive. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and, and even even a squidge of defensiveness is enough to give your you know your critics, even your fans, your fans who feel betrayed. Those are even worse than the critics. Um, something to you know, something to latch on to. Well, it sounds like a very interesting emotional state to be in for a CEO who, uh, I mean, the Airbnb. Uh, um, the, the CEOs of, of all these small companies, in order to get to where they are, they have to be extremely aggressive, extremely arrogant to a point. Uh, they've got to raise a lot of money, hire people based on a promise, put a product out there that's not fully baked or tested, and then say to the world, this is great, and I'm great, and we're great, uh, and you, the users, are great. Uh, and, and then when they make a mistake, which is going to happen, right, um, they have to go into this completely different emotional state. And, and Brooke, how do you deal with CEOs who are... They're, they're alpha in every possible way, and then they've got to roll over, as Owen says, which he's right about. They've got yep. to roll over and say, oh, I'm so, 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 so very sorry. I mean, how do you, how do the, you get them into that state? 
And every CEO is different. And I don't care if you're a 25 year old CEO or if you're a 65 year old CEO, uh, it's going to be difficult to do. And there are some that are, are better at it than others. I will say you only have one chance, certainly in the in in this economy, in this sort of you know fast pace of, of the internet world, you only have one chance to say I'm sorry or to make a mistake. You can't keep doing this. This isn't like you know when you're a kid and you screw up and apologize to your parents over and over again. You only get one shot at this. Um, and I think you you know you have to play it absolutely as Owen says, not defensively, but 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 incredibly delicately so where you're 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 explaining the situation taking a hit doing a mea culpa but also making it clear that moving forward this will not happen again the problem is that you get these situations where you might set precedent i think that's what happened with airbnb they have one person that's complaining saying they got robbed saying all this stuff happened and they're saying well if we if we go after this one we're, that means we're going to address every single person and that's not scalable i guess is what they're thinking and then it just blew up and and they should have addressed it right then and there and they need to figure out what that means from a from from procedure moving forward um so well and with, with airbnb there were all these other factors like the you know they were worried that the bad publicity around this was going to um was going to uh destroy their upcoming funding round like you know investors would walk away if they saw uh but they saw can't it was becoming hide. a mess but they, yeah, it, they made it worse question. so yeah, what has I happened with what has happened with airbnb i mean i think we're agreeing here that uh, the Gawker story, notwithstanding that Dave Morin's apology, while perhaps 24 hours late, was appropriate, but mm -hmm. um, the Airbnb CEO's name slips my mind at the moment. Forgive me, Brian uh, Chesky. Brian, yeah. yeah, Brian's apology maybe was a little too defensive. Uh, what effect has that had on Airbnb? I mean, and Brooke, you said that um, you only get one chance, but if you look at Apple and AntennaGate and then uh, Foxconn, and you look at Facebook and the ongoing privacy flaps. Um, we in, in in the in the journalism world and in the in the commenting world say you know our our um, being angry at these companies will tear them down, but then they just keep coming back and screwing yeah. up over and over again. And What's well, going I should on there? clarify. I should clarify. I think it, it's size of company matters. I mean, I, you, yeah. I think that Apple and or whether it's Oracle or Facebook or whatnot, these guys they have the ability and the, and the flexibility to make these mistakes and keep. They're not going to go anywhere after them. And I'm talking about the startup. World, the startups okay. that are building a a base that is so crucial, like an Airbnb, it's you you can't make those mistakes over and over again. It's just that the the people will stop using the service. There will be such a a fear uh, that sets in. But I think p what I've seen from Airbnb is that some people are affected by it truly, but others sort of moved on and are letting it happen and see if the experience is good for them. Then it's going to be you know something they continue to use mm. until it happens to them so i mean we we're all driven by fear and greed right um in in almost anything mm -hmm. so often we overplay as journalists rafe you and i overplay the fear and underestimate the greed and greed you know by greed i don't i don't just mean like wall street let's make a lot of money greed greed is i want something with facebook for example it's i want more connectedness with everyone who's touching my life um, mm -hmm. And so the fear of like, oh, I'll be somehow exposed is much smaller than that desire for connection. Um, and and I, I, think, I, I think the same thing is true with, with PATH. Like, okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're abstractly afraid of this idea that, you know, a copy of our address book is on PATH servers. But really, we're much more greedy for that, you know, for that ability to share every little moment in this really beautiful interface on our, you know, on our phones with our friends. Mm -hmm. What is a CEO to do? I mean, again, to bounce between these two worlds, uh, how, Brooke, do you teach a, a CEO to listen to the, uh, the zeitgeist of, of what's happening? It's really important. I mean, one of the things we have to find the balance of is, and I've always called it, and I've said this publicly, it's sort of the under 35-year-old, over 35-year-old CEO. The ones that are under 35 are reading the comments, will read comments and blogs, will read the tweets, will read all these things, and they will, and I, you know, I'm not meant as a grand generalization, but I, I see this with a lot of our, our younger CEOs, and they understand it, and they rationalize it, and they understand even if it's negative, they move, and they're incredibly diligent about responding to each and every person as much mm -hmm. as they can. You'll see like a Daniel Eck will do that 
when when talk, communicating with people on uh, via Twitter around, around Spotify, the older CEOs get very emotional. They'll see those comments. They'll get very uh, reactive. They get very emotional response, and that's a more difficult situation. So we have to help them sort of not not react quickly, not do the knee jerk reaction, not fire off a comment on a blog post, which I'm sure you've seen, Rafe. Mm. People do when they get mad at you, and they'll you know flame you out in a in a, in a comments, and that's something we really need to control. Because even mm. even if somebody is, you know, we think they should go after and, and say, listen, I think you're wrong in this article. There's a better way of doing it, and it needs to be a direct, you know, less defensive, not emotional reaction. Well, speaking of that, Owen, I want to throw this uh, mm-hmm. riff off of that and throw this to you. Our, our Kathy Brooks, our friend in the in the chat room, is asking, what role does the media have in uh, either um, educating or fomenting these issues? Uh, what's the responsible take of of any of our, our businesses when one of these things blows up? Well, you know, I think, I, I think that the, um, the interplay between Gawker and TechCrunch on, um, on the issue of what did Path say and when did, it, when did they say it about, um, about address book data, uh, that's, that is a great example of what people call iterative journalism. Now, a lot of people rip on this because it means you make mistakes, you correct things as you go. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the media, but it gets more facts on the table. And I think that is the number one duty of, of media is to put new facts out there. You've got to you enhance the story. Wrong. But yeah. then the fact is, is kind of a loose phrase at this point. But I mean, well, that's the thing in this, in this day and age, as we know, I mean, a small little rumor that may never have ex- even been a problem or a small crisis, which never would have gotten out beyond the, mm-hmm. you know, the walls of a company now in, in social media is out before the person has even, you know, hung up the phone. And right. so that, and it's getting out there and there's so much misinformation. And as you say, oh, and people are writing and writing and writing, but the thing is they'll, they'll write something once and it may be wrong and they'll go back and fix it, but those eyeballs may not go back and read the correct version right so a lot of this information is put out there and it just becomes you know and that's why it's so important for the company to get ahead of it so quickly and and not waste that opportunity to get in front of their users not waste this uh, as as a time to then step forward and and get their statement out there quickly so the misinformation stops. Uh, Margaret uh, Venmachers, who is uh, a former uh, communication pro over at Outcast and now at uh, Andreessen Horowitz, a partner over there, has this great line, which she repeats. I don't think she made it up. It's uh, when I was talking to her about this, she said, never waste a crisis. Um, Discuss that. What does that, is that something you agree with? And how does a business like a path or Pinterest, which also had a flap this week or Facebook or any of those guys, how do they not waste the attention that comes from being in a crisis? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Pinterest is absolutely wasting a crisis here because they've just been absolutely silent. And this has been bring a problem us, with it. In, 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 in 10 words or less, uh, bring us up to speed on what well, well, the crisis which, is. Which Pinterest crisis? I mean, there yeah, is the, there's the, um, the, affiliates, um, the affiliate links. Mm-hmm. That's uh, the one. That's this week's. Scandal. Yeah. Yeah. And the latest one, though, is, uh, is accusations of Facebook and email spam. Mm. Um, so the first one, uh, Pinterest takes links, um, and, and they've not, as far as I know, uh, Pinterest has not come out and publicly acknowledged this in a new statement, but their partner, Skim Links, has said, right. yes, we do this for Pinterest. Pinterest takes links and adds a bit of code so that they get a, cut, uh, a kickback from Amazon or other e-commerce sites uh, whenever someone clicks on a link and buys something. Freaking this is genius very, business, business model, I oh, do have and to it, say. It, it's yeah. very common, but, and but I, I you know, I, everyone say, does shocking? this. I didn't think it was shocking, but they, but it, no, a lot but of people did. What was shocking is that they did this without telling anybody. Again, it's the under-disclosure issue. So mm-hmm. uh, going back to the topic, how is Pinterest wasting this opportunity to communicate? Well, and, and, and let me tell you why, actually, this is more sensitive than people understand. Okay. Pinterest's core community is design blogs. It's people in creative industries. And a lot of these people have their own blogs where they are actually making money off of affiliate links, and that's a big, you know, that's, you know, not insignificant revenue source for them. Okay. So uh, Pinterest has co-opted them and said, this is actually a better place for you to do this than your own blog. Um, but now Pinterest is making money the way they used to make money. And no one's really talked about that. And it's, it's you know, I, I would be very disturbed if I realized, oh, this is happening. Um, Pinterest has a great 
way, you know, you want to talk about not wasting a crisis. I suggested this in my dot, dot, dot column. Pinterest should say, you know what? We are cutting in all of our pinners 50% on affiliate fees. Anything off of your pins, you get 50% of the affiliate money we make. And their business would explode, and they would, they would get a lot of goodwill. Well, whether or not they can do that, I, I certainly agree in that they have wasted this opportunity to come out, to connect with their users, and to offer up a statement. I mean, we're in an amazing space right now where people can connect, where the users, consumers feel this, this emotional connection to the companies for which they are participating in. That's why everybody reacts the way they do. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the same thing with a, you know, with, with a car company or uh, you know, any of the brick and mortar companies we grew up with. Now we have a face, the CEOs, are, they, we feel this connection. We feel we know Mark Zuckerberg. We feel we know Dave Warren. We feel we know these people. And yeah. this gives them I mean, an opportunity it's, it's, to connect. And when you don't use that opportunity, you lose that connection with your users. Oh, it's a problem that Ben Silverman is such a cipher, frankly. Like he needs to be out there much more. And I, you know, my my sense is he might be shy, but that's you know not. Can't be shy in this business. No, can't be shy. Um, finally, I want to ask you guys. Uh, how, it, it, many of our viewers and listeners are starting their own businesses. How do you evaluate your exposure, your risk profile to a blow up like this? How do you know? I mean. Path should have known. Pinterest should have known that they had this exposure. How do you audit your own uh, exposure to this? Well, from a communication standpoint, I can say that sometimes, you know, the communications people, if, if it's a startup, they may not even have internal people. They won't know. So it's not like they're even advising them to do or not to do. I hope that the companies out there learn from these mistakes um, and realize that in this day and age, we have to be transparent. There's, I mean, something is going to get uncovered, whether it's a rogue engineer that's like, this is bullshit, or whether something accidentally gets out. You just can't play these tricks in these games. I'm sure, you know, there's a lot going on that we don't know everywhere, but uh, a lot of the dirty laundry has a way of getting out there, and you need to be incredibly transparent. These are little things that may, may soon get bigger, and you may think, oh, it's not a big deal. We're going to roll it out in a couple weeks. It's Timing is everything, so you have to address it be open, be transparent from the get-go. Owen, any I, final words? I, I, I think you have to pretend that you are a, uh, you know, a blogger at Gawker or you know, <laughs> you, whichever site is your worst nightmare and ask yourself, what would you write about this company if you knew all of its secrets? And God, that's then, a terrifying thought. And then plan accordingly. Jesus, I'm going to have nightmares at night now just on that one. Gawker in my head. Yeah. All right. Well, on that scary note, uh, Owen Thomas is a uh, writer at The Daily Dot and founding editor of that site. Brooke Hammerling is founder of Brew PR, a really good communications company. Uh, they can be reached. Uh, let's see. Their Twitter handles are uh, at Brooke with an E at the end and uh, at Owen Thomas. And for notes and all of that, go to the Reporters Roundtable uh, site blog on uh, on CNET. Uh, Brooke, Owen, thank you so much for making the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Stephen, thanks, thanks so much for producing. And we'll see you guys all next week. Take care, thank everyone. You. Thanks.